Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And just a reminder, our home base is wedontdie.com, where you can always find our free Sunday gathering with medium demonstration included. You can join our Facebook community, one of our upcoming classes, and so much more. Way back in April of 2020, when the world came to a standstill due to COVID, my good friends, Scott, Darren, Carrie, Phil, and I created our online Sunday gathering and medium classes as a way to stay connected to others and help people believe that our loved ones are still with us and that the afterlife is very real. We met a nice young man named Tim Southwell. He was one of our earliest medium students, and now four years later, one of our longest and most committed, not only to his own development, but he volunteers and he helps host student practice sessions and has been a guest medium on our Sunday gatherings many times. Tim adheres to the ethics of proper medium readings taught by our great tutors, Carrie McLeod and Phil Dykes. And I'm proud to say that he now offers readings himself on his website, psychicmediumtim.com. I have to be honest, I really like Tim and I invited him to be our guest today, certainly to find out more about him, why he's interested in mediumship, why he believes in the afterlife, but also his thoughts on proper medium training and what his training has made available to him and what it could mean in the future with mediums. So coming to us from Ontario, Canada, Tim Southwell, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi, Sandra. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. That Wow, what an intro there. <laughs> I think it was the young man, that especially that stood out. But the yeah, older I'm you excited get, to be here. Yeah, the old, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. The older you get, everybody's young. And you are young. You are young. <laughs> You're but, excited, and I am too. It's like butterflies yeah. in my stomach every time I get to interview somebody. Yeah. No, it's a thrill, thrill to be here. And there's. I'm just excited about the journey itself. It's been as you said, four years, it's gone by so fast and so slow at the same time, it seems. That's unbelievable that that's happened. And I, in those four years, there's so many things I never, ever would have imagined happening. Before we get into those wonderful things, tell us a little bit about you, where you're from, maybe a little bit of your past history. What do you do for a living? Um, sure. And uh, yeah, and how you've found out about this wonderful world of afterlife. That's the last part. I'm still trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> and it's funny how that comes up in, in readings. It's almost as if it, it's not buried subconsciously, but you never really think about it because it just is happening to you. And when we do our practices too, one of the things I'm thinking of right now is that we often don't say too much about ourselves so that we kind of, you know, keep that, especially in the psychic readings. But I know in, in coming here, we'll just let her fly and uh, sort of <laughs> see, see what happens. A number of people know these things anyways. But it's interesting that in meeting all the people around the world as well to find out how different all of our beginnings have been. I, it, and mine's going to sound like one of those old stories, but I did grow up in a farm house originally in a rural setting in Ontario. So that means there's no neighbors close by. There's farm farmland. Neighbors are maybe a mile or a half away. And then stayed in that same area. We moved to three different places. My parents sold the farm after they bought the farm <laughs> and then um, kept part of the land. I moved up there. And then after that's when I, by that time I was going off to university. And I guess in that time span, I would include things like my upbringing would have been more Christian based and it would have been regular church going. The, the nearest community, which you're well aware of, Sandra, we talked about that. That was really cool that you used to go through the Tyrone, the little village. And that was part of serving the racetrack, Mossport. All of that was part of my background. It's interesting because it's not like we live close by each other and you know neighbors and you know everything that's going on. You kind of do in the country, except that expands over a wide area. So where that comes up is in readings, when uh, people are talking about, I have someone here for you, you kind of have to scan my memory and it has to be miles because we're so separated from each other. But I'll go back to the other. So it was a church, a community church in Tyrone. And that would have been mainly Christian based again. And that was the background weekly. And that took me all the way through 
to university. In that time, I did learn how to play piano. So that was started out just as kind of a hobby. I can still remember the question. There's some things that stick in your mind. One of them was, do you want to take, it was like that. Do you want to take piano? But you know, your sister, and that was mom talking. We have, you can, your brother tried, didn't, not successful. He wanted to play drums. And do you want to try? And, and it was grade two. And I said, sure, why not? It's funny. I can't say I fell in love with it, but it just really clicked. And there was a lot of things. One of the things that clicked was a theory and the notes behind it, which later would come up in, in some minor composing or things that I would do later on. The lessons, there were 75 cents for a lesson. It was a nice lady from the community. She'd been doing it for years. She was close to the end of her life too. She just wanted to teach piano. It was fantastic. All of that's like a tapestry of background, right? So I brought that to the church. I started to play piano for them and I still do on occasion. And then youth group things started happening. I got involved in that. So that's the level to which I was involved in believed in the philosophy, the dogma, that's what you were raised on, so you don't question that so much, but always knew there was something a little bit more. There was, there were things that just, you know, a lot of things were understandable, I'll say that, but it just seemed as if they were missing pieces, or there's a little bit that just wasn't quite finished in, in fully understanding what was going on. With that too, I would also say around that timeline with one of my grandmothers who had an old, old, old house, believed in ghosts. She was very religious, but she believed in ghosts. She believed in spirits. She believed that things like that happened. And I'm not sure where she stood about living on and the afterlife, but there was a heaven in, in her mind, absolutely. And in her religion, I think that heaven, we all encounter all at the same time, I believe. I'm not quite sure. Hers was a little bit, her religion was a little bit more intense than mine. But in mine, for sure, there was a heaven, an afterlife, but then they kind of left it at that. They didn't really go into that. And yet you're thinking, well, if that's all where we're, if that's where we're headed to, I'd sure like to know more about what that is. I'll mention too, maybe at that time, because there aren't too many neighbors around, you kind of create your own world. You create your own adventures, your many adventures. I'd be sent outside, still love nature as a result. That always comes up in a reading. You're someone who loves nature, <laughs> but there's a reason. And in reflecting now, back to then, not so much imaginary friends, but I would have, this is bizarre, I know, but as a kid, I had a bank. So it was the Bank of Southwell. And I would have imaginary people come in and deposit money and withdraw money. This is someone like this is kindergarten or pre-kindergarten even. And and believe me, I don't want to get into accounting and I'm not financially, you know, so obsessed. But just that was the talk back then. Those are the people I created. And I'm still not sure. Did I just create those imaginary people or was I getting some assistance or help? I don't know. I didn't feel like it. And even now when I kind of reflect back, I'm not sure it feels like that. But you never know. I do remember talking to trees in my mind, not out loud. And as a little kid, so, you know, you're okay to do that as a little kid. If you do that as an adult, people might look at you. But it's almost like there's a kind of a mini conversation that could go on with nature and animals as well. And we had 100 acres, so I could go out for a long walk in amongst woods and trees and streams. Just love all that bit. Now I'd probably go and say, are there wood nymphs? Are there things like that that are around? So that was, in a way, it's sort of hazy in the background, sort of spiritually, other than that upbringing. And then going to university was the big change, big change over. I'd say through that time too, as often the case is, I believe, with people who decide to go into mediumship or who are called to mediumship or it happens to them, whichever, there's sort of a feeling of not quite fitting in or being a little bit different. And I think everyone goes through that at least at some point, and maybe we never really outgrow that or get away from that. But there was that feeling. And at the time it was okay. So I, I had some friends, but they aren't close because they weren't geographically or physically close. So you learn to kind of live in your own world, in your own mind, and just sort of feel for things. I would say at that point, I was in a way a sensitive child. I was sensitive to my surroundings. Some might say oversensitive, but as all people are, I think when you're out there in nature, you just start reaching out a bit beyond yourself without even realizing it, I guess. And th these are things I didn't realize at the time. This is all in reflection. 
in university, I originally went to go into meds. I was planning to go to med school. That didn't happen. Well, within the first year, I, I love that sort of stuff. And I'll watch it on TV. Even now, what little TV I do watch, it's it's like Dr. Pimple Popper or all the surgeries. And sometimes even during dinner. Yeah. And oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll, I'll be eating that fascinated. <laughs> but that then physics, first year physics university came. And no, it, it just, it, I was okay in high school, but not for university. That was probably one of the first struggles first major struggles. Cause up to that time, I'd say things were kind of sheltered. I was in a world in a bubble. And now here I was on my own hours away from my hometown and a couple of people I knew, but basically on my own and finding that what I had in mind was not going to work out for the rest of my life. So a bit of a crisis there around Christmas time, I can remember. And then it was my parents who said, well, and they're probably thinking we invested in your piano playing, but, but they were saying, you know, here's something that you've done. Have you ever considered doing that? In my mind, I didn't want to let down what I thought other people wanted me to do. So I still am fascinated by medicine, but music was where my heart was. And that's the degree I finished. And kept the religion. I stopped going to church during that time. This is kind of answering that sort of spirituality afterlife question. Went to Nashville for just the heck of it. Just up and decided, you know what, I'm going to go to Nashville. I'd worked during the summer at a, the local car factory. So that was a fair bit of money for students for paying for their year's tuition. So I had some money left over. Went to Nashville because of the music. I wasn't studying country music, but country music was still pretty cool. And there was also, actually, I, I do recall there was an award. It's the Dove Awards for Christian music. So I went to to go to that. And it was while I was watching that, it, it's almost like something descends on you. I realized, what the heck am I going to do with music? And I see all of this going on. Did I, in my mind, think I was going to be part of this industry? It is so big, so vast, so not me. I thought it might be. It wasn't. And I remember going back to my hotel that night, and that was another crisis. This was four years after the previous one. What am I going to do? I had some moments there. That's probably the first time I felt inspired by something outside of me. And that, would, I'd say, would be the turning point for listening to something outside of me. And that's, I would say, where I became more conscious of the spirit world. And I felt after that there was something more out there. And at the same time as that, all the other buildup from my earlier Christian belief starts kind of chipping away. It doesn't completely disappear because it's still Christian, but it just... All that understanding doesn't quite fit anymore because I've just had something happen that doesn't define that hasn't been defined and was very personal. Couldn't explain it or even really want to tell anyone else. And I would say that's kind of the very tip of that iceberg in getting to realize there is more. There are spirits, there are souls that you can talk to beyond what you see and what you may even know. And that it's possible, hopefully not under this much distress, but it is possible to reach out to them and to feel them and to interpret things that come from that other side, the afterlife. And that was just the very beginning of that. I'll fast forward because I decided there to go in edu education. That was how I could do my music. And I thought, ah, great, I can pay the bills. I can actually do some great stuff. They always talk about the vacations, you know, all of that's possible. There's a whole lot of buildup that goes around those times, though, and dealing with situations and students and all of that. So I was there for a while. Or sorry, finishing up my education almost the very last week and car accident. I was in the back seat of a little Chevette hit by a drunk driver as I was coming home and... That would have been, so there's a lot of time that kind of happened between these three things, but that would have been the clincher for me. So not that previous encounter, but in the car accident, it wasn't quite a near death experience, but it was, I, I 
come to, I think, believe now is like an out of body experience. Because I remember the impact. I was in the back seat. The back seat was pushed all the way up to my dad, who was driving, and or actually all the way up to my mom. I was sitting behind my dad. So what prevented that was one of two things because I, my leg was snapped in that it kind of got caught and I was in the hospital. So there's recovery and a lot of time for myself for reflection and coming to terms with things. But I got to see a picture of that car a couple months afterwards as well. And it seems like that area that I was in, it took a while to want to look at that. Actually, it was in a, it was either my leg that stopped that from the impact or it even kind of seemed like it was a little protected. And I'm not saying that I know or I feel that any divine thing, creature, spirit, angel, whatever you want to believe, came to that rescue. But I would not doubt now that that could be a possibility. That were kind your of, parents okay? Parents, they were in the front seat. They had kind of like a seatbelt burn. <laughs> you know, they had that bruise because they had that impact and they were protected by that. Mom, a little bit more so because the car was pushed up. Dad, less so because I was kind of part of that impact. And so they were pretty good. They didn't go to hospital. They didn't have a need to go to hospital. I tried to get out of the car. I couldn't because my leg wouldn't go with me. So <laughs> I had to be lifted out of that. But in that experience, in that impact, I can still hear and feel it was like I was sort of shot out into a darkness and where I asked, is this it if I died? And getting a response back that, no, you haven't, you need to go back. And so that all happened in real time in seconds. It seemed like minutes, like it did go by fast. That's, I think, to me, what triggered the thought in my head that I need to investigate what's more out there. I can do my job. I can teach for a while, teach for a number of years. Loved it, actually. Loved it more than I thought I would. Because there's a lot of that, the interaction with young minds. But there's also, I went into counseling for a bit, too. And that's even more interaction. You get to see a little bit more right away, an impact that can help. And then right before COVID, I, I said, I'm not coming back. I saved up enough money, kind of like a nest egg. By that time, I thought I felt the calling to go and investigate what's out there. Yeah, it, you know, a calling that I just had to reply to, respond to. So I didn't have a plan other than I feel this is the right thing to do at this point. How in the world did you find us? That's cool. And that's actually the next step because at, at that point I'm going, well, this is great. Now what? <laughs> yeah. I have created all this time. I'm living on a budget. So what, what are we going to do? Uh, and then I thought, you know what, there is a spiritualist church. And at that point dropped into a couple and, and I was thinking, this is really interesting. This would be kind of cool. I visited Lilydale, thought that was really interesting. And I took some classes there feeling the need to know how does this work? How can I make it work with me? Because I thought some things were happening, very little, and I didn't get explanations. So I thought I need explanation. I need to find something that's going to land solidly because it was a trickling that I needed that. So Spiritualist Church, just outside of Toronto, they were, I remember that they were going to do a cruise. So I thought with some mediums, I'm going to have a look and see which mediums they were scheduled to do because they canceled due to COVID. And that's where I saw Carrie and Phil. And I thought, sure, let's have a look online, set up a mentoring session with them just to say, am I going nuts? Because is this, <laughs> you know, some things are happening. I've noticed these things. I'm, I'm not sure whether I have any kind of caliber or calling or skill level. Is it just an interest or is it all my imagination? Because that's the first place to go to. Very, I'm a very mind person, so always thinking in the mind. And that was my first go-to. And from that, I think I had two mentoring sessions with them. One to kind of get over myself and just realize, wow, what the heck just happened in that conversation? Because they take you through some some steps, see what you can do. And, and they mentioned that they do have a couple of classes if I'm interested. And they are in the gathering if I'd like to watch and see what kind of things they do. That was perfect because it's almost like test driving <laughs> in a way, because you got to see Carrie and Phil do a demonstration and you go, wow, that is 
Look at the accuracy of that. Look at the impact. This is different from the way I've been experiencing. I call it sort of the UK version. I know that's not, you know, the true nature of it. They're really, it's evidential, very evidential. And things that people couldn't look up on Facebook, the way people acted, behaved. And I thought, that's amazing. And still nervous about it. I, I decided I would sign up for a class. I just want to do a little shout out to Carrie and Phil. I knew them prior, obviously, to COVID a few years, and th they sunk right into my heart. The evidence, the authenticity, and they're just great people. So they're two of my closest friends in the whole wide world. We've been running classes at wedontdie.com with them as our tutors, as I said in the beginning. Also, now that the earth's cleaned up a bit, they're traveling Australia, New Zealand, England, America, Canada. And I recommend wholeheartedly go to mymediumship.com and it's all things Carrie and Phil. So we'll continue on with Tim's journey into these classes for sure, because that is where I met Tim. And I think in one of the breakout rooms, I'm just like we worked together, your grandmother came through to me and vice versa. And it was just such an extraordinary experience. Um, that I think every person, whether you want to be a medium or not, you should take some training because there's something that happens to go from a faith and a hope in the afterlife to a belief and a real knowing. And in those classes, when you can actually feel the presence of the deceased person, and sometimes you actually feel like you are them and memories of theirs, they come out of your mouth and the person can take it. I mean, that that takes you into that knowing. So, Tim, let's go into some of the training because you've been with us quite a while now. And to go from that investigation to now having your own website, being a medium with all the ethics that we'll get into a bit later. But also, you've been our guest medium several times on our Sunday gathering and student demonstrations. And I am tickled pink at how down to earth you are, how you work with the spirit world, how you can be vulnerable and just share what you get. And you have gotten just some incredible evidence and really have brought through that feeling that all people, whether if their loved ones come through or not, that you actually feel the presence of those people that are in the afterlife. Well, thank you. It's still part of a journey that's unfolding. And a lot of that I think is discovering yourself and discovering, recognizing both the light and the shadow of yourself, doing that work, being open to that. In the training, I remember the first part of the training for sure. And and that alignment, the way that Phil and Carrie, and I'll try not to keep on, you know, <laughs> saying how great things are. You can, because I yeah, feel okay, the exact great. <laughs> same way. I think they're the best in the business. Yeah. So why not <laughs> they explain what's going on now they don't jump in on top of you and explain what's going on if you have a question they will explain but within the course of a class if you're noticing something or either hey this just happened or i wonder why you know and you can put up your hand you get that answer that's my big thing was i finally got an explanation and sometimes the explanation is, well, you'll have to discover that for yourself. <laughs> but even that is an explanation because you realize, okay, so this isn't crazy stuff. This is what's happening. And with the classes I went, I was one of the people in the first classes that ducked out in the first breakout room. So, you know, they'd have the description, they'd have the explanation. And then they'd say, okay, now we're going to go to breakout rooms. And I'd be fast looking for that thing to click out because I was too nervous. I thought I can't do this. And my gosh, here's the other thing. What if people find out that I do this? What about people I know? That's a hurdle. You do discover certain personal hurdles that you have. The self-limiting beliefs is what Phil and Carrie would refer them as. And you do have to look at them. You're not necessarily going to get rid of them, but you do kind of need to tackle them. Am I good enough? imposter syndrome when things start working and you say i this shouldn't be happening in fact i still kind of say that how on earth does this happen <laughs> yeah and i can remember that breakout room you're talking about sandra because that was a christmas one and i remember we we're in the room and this was one of the first times i think there was like a small group of us three or four maybe and we each had to read uh for somebody in the room we weren't sure where it was going to go and 
as information was coming through, although you try not to make it look like that, you're kind of going, oh my gosh, this is, yeah, that's right. And, and that's right. And he's, and the big thing for me in all of those classes was clairsentience. Prior to that, I could maybe see some things in that first mentoring session. I saw a button and then they asked me, describe the button. Then they asked me what's on top of the button because it was something. Who does the button belong to? And that mentoring session, that part, which lasted maybe 10 to 15 minutes, that was mind blowing as well. And I thought, this is right. Are they just saying this so that, you know, I'll, I'll fall in? <laughs> but no, it, you soon discover that's not who they are. <laughs> and they'll tell you what's what. But that happened. And then in classes, things like that started happening. And in reflection, again, this is where the spirit world steps in and kind of says, okay, clairvoyance, you're sort of used to, you're going to be saying goodbye to that for a while because you need to work on clairsentience, the actual feeling, and you understand all of the clairs from Phil and Carrie. And that, so it was more, it's this, it is called mental mediumship, but I was using basically my mind and that is uh, fallible it's easy to kind of derail or not kind of get things right by that. Cause you're trying to interpret and you're just sort of the mind's trying to figure out what does that mean? What does that mean? And instead, uh, clairsentience where you're feeling with the soul, with the gut instinct, that sort of intuition getting into that. And eventually the feelings, knowing that those are your emotions getting involved. Um, that's, the heart and soul. And actually, so in the readings that Sandra, you're talking about with the gathering, which kind of still makes me chuckle because I get nervous with those, even though I might seem down to earth or relaxed, I still get really nervous. It's just sort of letting go and saying, okay, I might be, I might go totally wrong here. I might be totally right. It doesn't matter. Actually, I'm not the one. This is the self-limiting. This isn't about me anyway. That the coming to that realization not looking at comparisons like that medium last week was amazing that's going to be scary to follow you can't you have to try to get over that and it takes time and this confidence comes and not just confidence in self but confidence in the spirit world that they've got your back and i know that now i know that because i've gone through enough things that i feel this didn't resolve itself just by me or there are times i had no idea how to handle this and you get this impulse this feeling that you practice in class, but then it starts happening in real life as well. And you start realizing, you know what, I need to say this to that person, or I need to reach out to this other person for some reason, I, you know, just to say hello, and you find out they're having a rough day. And those things start happening kind of on a sideline more and more. And all of that is part of that proof that they're there and that they're kind of feeding you positive stuff and things that are supportive. In fact, the whole language, the whole energy about that is, and if I were to boil that down, love. That whole thing is about love. And when you can, on a Sunday, enter into a reading and, and know that you want to have healing happen to somebody, you want them to feel better about that. It has nothing to do with me. There's a message that someone in the spirit world needs to deliver to that listener, whoever they may be. There's something that they need to walk away with. I'm grateful that I could be a part of that, but that's where I have to draw the line. I have no other part in that other than just try to interpret things correctly so that they go in. And I love the yes, no, and the I don't know, because some people, it might feel very confining at first. And when you get a no, you have to get over that. That's one of the first lessons. That whole first year, I'd say, was getting over someone saying no. In other words, you, you haven't got the information quite right. And there's a multitude of possible reasons why. And you just learn to work through and practice those. That's all in the first reading, first year. And again, if you get over yourself, because I got to know doesn't mean I'm horrible or awful or I should give up on this. It just means I misinterpreted something. Something's a little off. And you get that support. Again, Phil and Carrie are there. When you're in the breakout room, they drop in. Listen to see how you're doing. If they need to give you some support right then and there, they will. Oftentimes there's a theme in the class, each class. So when you pop out of the breakout room, they'll say, we're noticing this. And then you're going, yes, okay, that happened to me. I, I misinterpreted it. This no meant I should have been aware that there was two speakers from the spirit world, not just one, for example. Yeah. I just want to say, Tim, that Carrie and Phil talked about the spiritualization of ourselves. And there are people... Even myself, I had taken a medium course years ago. 
And it was a good course over the course of a weekend. I realized that somehow miraculously I could tap into this world. Not always, but like you said, when it came from love. But at the end of the three days, the lady said, oh, here's your diploma. You can go charge $150 an hour. And thankfully, I knew better, right? I knew better. And as Carrie and Phil teach, it's being a medium is a calling. It's not something, go take a class, charge money, get paid. Now, I think the spirit world will do everything they can to help people that genuinely want to serve. But what's happened, and we're so passionate about changing what mediumship is on planet earth because like you said the uk mediums and a lot of the better mediums stem from a certain group of tutors from long ago with proper ethics but unfortunately right now in the world and definitely in america because this is where i'm closest to there's mediums that charge hundreds and hundred dollars an hour just insane amount of money they don't have the 10 minute money back guarantee if you're not feeling it, it you could, close the uh, reading, either the sitter or the medium, because sometimes things happen and no one pays. They're not well trained. I'm not knocking them because they may not know they can be better than they are. They don't have that interest of continuing to develop and develop themselves, which is so important. You know, this really is a calling, like I said, not a career. And the yes, no, or I don't know is so important because again, these high price mediums, and I hear from listeners all the time and bad experiences that they paid $600, $800 an hour only to be thrown bits of information that they couldn't understand. And then the medium said, well, who am I talking about? What does this mean to you? And so in the My Mediumship, We Don't Die plan, it's for the medium to tap into their feelings, the clairsentience, and be out there on the skinny branches because you don't know if it's your imagination or if this is real and put that information out there. And the recipient can only say yes, no, or I don't know. There's no feeding the medium. And with that, that raises the level. And as they teach, no simply means new opportunity. But this is a love affair, if you want to call it that, with your own soul and with the spirit world that I'm willing to serve. And you're not going to learn something in one week or a weekend (laughs) that will be able to hang up that little plaque and charge obscene amounts of money. What do you say to all that that I just spilled out? <laughs> no, I, I absolutely agree with you. And even down to the hundreds, thousands of dollars to take some courses to get that certificate, which at the end of you're basically the same person you were at the beginning of the weekend. It, it takes much more time than that. It, it takes an example I was thinking I could give is if, if you feel the relationship, that's usually part of your evidence that you would come through. You'd say, I have a lady here and this is your aunt. So how on earth does that come up? I I don't know, but I know how I worked on that because relationships is one of the early things to work on. And the way I would work on that is I would think of my aunt. I do have an aunt in the spirit world. So I would think of her. And when I thought of her, you know, you kind of get that remembrance, that feeling of what she's like. So then when breakout room comes and you're about to start, I have a lady here. And all of a sudden you get this impression that there's a familiarity kind of like my aunt. And unless... You know, later on, she might actually say, Andrew, you hear her in your mind say that, (laughs) you know, sometimes when you're not picking up clues, they are, they will step forward and and really make themselves known. Then you recognize that feeling of ant. And then you say, I have an ant in spirit and you go on to further describe what else you're encountering or feeling, or you might be seeing. And, and then you start realizing those yeses are coming because I can relate to things in my life. So I can relate. It takes time to develop something like that. And there's all sorts of aspects of that. Relatives, when an image comes through, what does that image mean? Because with Phil and Carrie, they would tell you that everything that you get right at the very beginning is all you need. Because the spirit world is so intelligent, they'll pack a whole lot of stuff there from color to even moving around in the image. Where is it located? How does that image appeal to you? What does it make you think of? That probably tells you something about the communicator. So there's a whole lot of things. It's like unpeeling the onion and you can't do that in the weekend. And I would say too, the courses are are so reasonable. That's I kind of mentioned that earlier about my budget was tight. 
in order to go and do this. And it was reasonable compared to the hundreds and other dollars. Plus, as everyone does, I've taken a course now and again here and there, UK, American, Canadian. And although there's always something valuable in all of them, the fit to me, and that's, I think, important, you have to find the fit for you. The fit for me is this style, that sort of leadership as well, that sort of direction. They're the really the ones who said, okay, now's the time to try the gathering. I think the first gathering would have been doing the address. So speaking like a, a mini sermon, if that's new to two other people. I don't, I'm not used to calling them addresses, but I've learned to. And then, so that was sort of okay, because I've done something like that in my career. And when I was at Lilydale, I was taking ministerial courses when it was live right before COVID happened. And then that kind of squelched that a bit and then it all became online. And then shortly after was, okay, you can do two messages or could you do two messages? And I, I didn't think I was ready. I, I like, I, I didn't say that <laughs> right away either. I, I just kind of went back and I thought, okay, I trust them, Phil and Carrie, because they have seen what's going on in classes. I, I, they have an in with the spirit world more so than I do. <laughs> so they would probably get that inspiration there as well, or a check at least checking in with them. I checked in how it felt and it was sort of that, again, this is early time. So the guy almost go clairsentient reading on self. What does this feel like? Does this feel good or does this feel, and of course the nerves start, but then it think, then within me, something says, if I'm practicing this, working towards this, why would I be stopping myself? You know, instead of the past, what if you fail? Instead it was, what if you succeed? And better yet, what if someone gets something really powerful out of your message for them that they understand? I may never understand, but they do. And I thought, yeah, there's that calling again. And that's really, that's part of it. Phil and Carrie talk about the why. Why would you go into mediumship? Why is this a calling for you? Because it's not going to be easy. There, there are a number of things. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of practice. And thankfully, I carved that out for myself. And I credit that for being able to, in the four years, be lucky enough to go as far as I have. And I'm still developing and I'm still, you know, in my mind, a student. And we should be thinking that way, I think, all the way through. Because the minute we stop that mindset, then we become stagnant and there's no more learning. Life is lifelong learning. I've always believed that in education and in mediumship. I feel yeah. the same way. Even my doctor, <laughs> <laughs> who I get the physical every year, she's continually learning right? So never stop. I want to talk a little bit about some of the readings because the spirit world uses us in some bizarre ways. They do, you know, clairsentience is the feelings, clairvoyance is images, but there's others. They can use our sense of taste, smell, hearing, songs. Could you share without obviously giving away people, but just some of those th things that maybe you remember that have happened in readings that you were out in the skinny branches and you're going to say it, but in your mind, you're thinking, this is crazy. And they go, yes, I can take that. Do you have any of those stories that come to mind? Yeah. I like that expression and the skinny branches, because that's the other part. You do have to push yourself. Otherwise you become comfortable. And yeah, the minute you start stopping yourself as, and you, you do need to be careful. That's part of the ethics as well, because you don't want to be blunt, abrupt, and you're, probably talking about someone who potentially has passed recently. And so you don't want to be, you know, opening up old wounds or fresh wounds even. So you kind of watch the wording and that you weigh that, but there's ways of saying things that get you there. I can think of an example of that. Suppose someone was a bit of a drinker. So you could kind of say it that way. It depends how the feeling comes across. And there is a reading and these things start popping in almost in spite of yourself. The spirit world kind of says, okay, I think they're ready for this and try this out. Unless you're taking a class exactly on clear gustians or the, the taste, you know, or what you might smell. I remember one of the first ones was cigarette smell. And I thought maybe I left a window open. And, <laughs> and, and so then as I was trying to work through, this is earlier times, I said, that's the other thing. Don't ask questions, make the statements. That's an early one to kind of trip yourself over. So instead of saying, and did, did your father used to smoke or grandfather used to smoke? You'd say, you'd say it as a statement. It's, it's stronger. And also you start believing and your body not 
automatically seems to check with that before it comes out of your mouth. So you'd say, and they used to smoke. And then you'd get a yes and you go, holy, there's a lot of holy jump in there. Holy, holy cow. <laughs> yeah, holy cow. That's it. There's a lot of that, at least for my experience that I go through. Some other ones, and before I mentioned that the message del is delivered in love, I still 100% believe that even for some of the readings I might mention now, which was someone who OD'd on drugs. So as I was going through that, and that was an early one, so I felt like I was stepping so carefully because I, you know, just kind of trust this is what's happening. And then I got a taste in my mouth. And I thought, that's an odd taste. It's kind of bitter. And then a smell came in as well. And I said, that's a lot like what I assume would be like drugs or whatever. And then I saw a hyperdermic needle. So it's almost like they were coming in from all sorts of directions. And I said, this person, she passed by overdosing yes and yet then, then here's where the feeling comes in she it wasn't intentional you feel as if you know you, if someone meant to do that you would sort of feel how they were feeling differently if and, and this just kind of came up out of the blue they were surprised themselves and they found themselves over there that's interesting in another level too because the first thing you learn is there are a lot of things you recognize, and that's how you can assimilate. I have an aunt who passed, so when I read for someone who has an aunt who passed, I can assimilate that. That makes sense. That's why some people are drawn to you as a reader, because they just have that feeling. And you're not everybody's reader, and you'll find that there's the match or not match. I'm glad you mentioned that guarantee that they suggest the 10 minutes and either rebook or you know reschedule. So far, that's happened once, and then you have to work through that as the medium, <laughs> as the beginning medium, kind of emotionally. But it, you realize, hey, it, it just is, and you move forward. That level of integrity, I would love to see everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. And I do know there's going to be mediums that charge more. Okay. Some people think the more you pay, the better you get, whatever. But to have that 10 minutes said, if you're not feeling it and you're not getting the evidence, you know, and like the medium can feel it too. Sometimes it's just not a match comes to an end, the person, they can either rebook or they don't pay. And I think if sitters can ask before they book a medium, do you have that, you know, do you have a level of guarantee? And I think it will weed out pretty fast. <laughs> so where did you hear that from? But it's important, even all the classes that we offer on the we don't die.com site, money back guarantee, if you're not happy, I want to know about it. You know, the price, the cost is not a lot compared to Gosh, it's probably a quarter or a fifth of what other medium classes are. And to have that guarantee takes away that fear. And there's only been about two or three people that have ever asked in all this time. And one was an old guy, couldn't hear through his hearing aids, somebody that just wasn't a fit. Another one, they didn't want to go in the breakout rooms like you said, <laughs> that, that fear. But it happens. You know, we're fighting our own humanity and everything in us wants to be right. And so it's hard to get into that breakout room and be wrong. But here's the thing. That's the place to be wrong. That's the place to explore. So if you're OK with being wrong, that's when you can have fun and that's when you can let your hair down. That's when you can try and just see. So if anybody's interested, please don't think you need to have it all figured out. You want to be wrong. Go for being wrong and just say what's there for you. How did you get over your fear of the breakout room? Or did you just push yourself through? Yeah, it's kind of the making of you, right? I just kind of pushed myself through. And after the first time I did, it felt so guilty. And I thought, why did I do that anyway? And that probably was one of the first times where I had to look at one of my areas to look at. Why was I afraid of something like that? And it was the no, it was being embarrassed. So what's that about? That's really kind of about ego. Okay, well, that's, why should that stop me? <laughs> that, you know, and I might have done it one more time. I, I can't swear for sure, but it, but it didn't happen right afterwards. I sat through that and kind of went, okay, this is working. This is happening. I assumed Everyone else in the class had been doing it for years and were experts and all the other things. And I was so wrong about that. And in fact, whether they had worked for years, I can remember working and being afraid of, of who I had in front of me. And I kind of went, oh my gosh. And, they, <laughs> and I knew they had worked at it. But the people that are drawn to this group, to these classes are really so gentle, so nice and understanding wherever you are. Nobody's going to be following the same timeline, the same path. Nobody 
reads in the same way even. So even that comparison is just out the window. So that kind of like peeling that onion in a way, bit by bit, you're realizing, well, that actually doesn't matter. So if I am wrong, and and there are breakout rooms where you're just totally wrong, that's the time to do it. And that's the time to, to start saying, okay, well, if it's not that, the next time I should try this. Ah, now I get it. And then you try that, and sure enough, that's it. Then the spirit world comes and says, okay, now you got it. We're going to change it up on you. <laughs> so it, it, you do need to have that sort of, what would you say, resiliency. You don't have to be super resilient, but if you can kind of look at yourself occasionally and kind of chuckle about, yeah, okay, so eh, no big deal. Like, you know, nobody, <laughs> this is one of the expressions one of my friends would say is, well, nobody died. And I would say, well, I hope they did. Otherwise we can't do a reading. <laughs> That's funny. I have not heard <laughs> yeah. that before. That is very funny. It's like getting back on a bicycle. You want to ride a bike, we fall, it happens. And plus, those in the spirit world were real people with real personalities. And they might have not have worked with you before, right? So I don't think when we go over there the hereafter that we have all the answers of the universe. So, you know, we're trying to work with the medium as well. I want to talk just a little bit about our spirit friends. There are like I said, when I took that medium class way back when, it was things like what they look like, how tall are they, how did they die, what's the message? No. Talk a little bit about how Carrie and Phil teach that these are real living people and they want to tell their stories. Yeah, ex exactly. And I remember one of the classes or courses on the weekend was about this telling the story. And that was eye opening. I, I one of the hurdles I had to kind of get over as well was when you're practicing and then you're bringing in someone in spirit. And I started just in mediumship classes, and then I added psychic classes because that really helps hone those skills of feeling and reaching out. At first, and I'm not proud necessarily to admit this, but I think this is common, and that is you're working with somebody's aunt. I'll say again. And then in a sense, you're just sort of, you're not doing a shopping list. That's not the way that that we do things for that. Instead, we wait to see what they have to give to you. They're going to pass along things to you. And can you interpret it? Can you understand it? Can you wait, be silent, and kind of accept the information? Like be receptive is probably a better word of saying. So receptive to that information. And one of the first hurdles I was talking about there was almost taking for granted that they were and are a living spirit. It was almost like they were helping out. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, let's try the next one. Okay, good, thanks. And then I noticed there's kind of a plateau in what happens when I'm thinking, when I thought that way. And I forget what it was, but there was a moment shift there when I realized, again, the holy cow <laughs> moments that come in. This is a real person and I'm not treating them with the respect I really should. And after every practice, after every reading, I absolutely thank the spirit for person for coming in now because I realize they're making that effort. It doesn't have to be through me, but they're choosing to work through me with the, the whoever the recipient is. And they live quite the life. And the more you're open to that idea and how much they're giving for that, then the more that blending seems to happen, actually, and it's more along the lines of there's a trust that they have in you as you're building your trust with the spirit world, realizing that they are people. That is somebody's aunt. That was somebody's and is somebody's you know, spouse or mother or father. That realization that you're working every single time with something so important, delicate, sacred as that, it's kind of awesome, awe-inspiring, and it really builds that appreciation. I became changed after that, even though I was practicing and I was at a certain, you know, developmental, internal person, that was one of those major shifts that I went, holy cow, why was I not considering this before? And that changed a few other things about how you viewed everyone. Every person coming in, every person you encounter is a soul as equal, as important as each other. And that is what guides me a lot. I can't think of it every single moment because I could do get mad at someone who drives too slow or too fast. <laughs> but, you know, that is that is something that sticks with me. And and that motivates me as well to want to be there for them. It, it's part of that people pleasing, but it's more in a useful way. 
I'm not trying to please them. I'm trying to be helpful to them and whatever I can do and recognizing um, the sacredness of that. We have to acknowledge our own humanity. I'm no saint, (laughs) nor would I well probably ever be because we are human. But to know that those in the spirit world, they are still people and they don't have a voice anymore. They may try and I do know that they communicate through our feelings. But so many people, they want the lights to flash on and off or they want something so obvious to appear as proof that their loved ones are there. But we're all mediums. We all have this capacity just like you know said before people want to play piano there you go people can learn and practice for years and years and years and become great at it other people have maybe a god-given talent for it but they still have to work at it we're all divine souls having this human experience and our loved ones come through and i just had this funny thought you know if i did interviews with people like some mediums do those readings. Tim, how tall are you? Where do you live? Why are you in this business? And then end the Zoom meeting, right? (laughs) No, the real people, talk to them, listen to them. If you get something wrong, dig in again, thank them. Our loved ones are very, very real. Oh my goodness. Tim, what else would you like to share? Is there something that we haven't spoken about yet? You want to share your website, what you're commitment is if someone wants to book a reading with you. Sure. It's an amazing journey. Maybe the one thing I would say on top of that is there are struggles because you learn a lot about yourself. It's never an easy journey. We all have life adventures that go on. One of the interesting things, I can't say the most exciting things, but one of the interesting things is everything that's gone on, and I can say it for myself, in my life, and piano and music is a big part of it, but any experience I've ever had enters into where I am now and all of that stuff, good or bad, it almost seems I design or was design or a combination of both. It's not wasted. None of that has been wasted at all. The good spirits and the happy spirits and I, with a small s <laughs> and, and the low times, the low spirits as well. And you really do grow emotionally and feeling that's been one of the biggest areas that I've had to develop. It will be different for each person. But it's quite the experience and the people you encounter tend to be of like mind. So that's very supportive, very helpful. And as time goes on, that can shift and that can change your friends, your family. You know, those things will change your relationships, your discussions with them. But it's all part of your spiritual growth as well. So the website I have is at psychicmediumtim.com. And also, too, there's information there about booking readings and a set there. And and as you mentioned, too, it's that 10-minute thing that if it's not quite going, then either we'll rebook or refund. Um, And those are the personal readings as well. If you have any questions, there's a way to contact me there as well. It's actually the same thing, psychomediumtim at gmail.com. But that's, you know, if you have questions beyond that. But otherwise, yeah, I tend to explain ahead of time what the reading is about, what it's like. It's, it tends to be 30 minutes or more. I say 30 minutes, but it tends to go on a bit longer. And for people who are brand new, it might be, ex- what are your expectations? What are your thoughts? What are your questions? If you've never done that before, never had a reading before, those are fine to ask. Absolutely. It's a little bit different than the TV people we see. They seem to be hard to contact. You would never talk to them personally. You know, a big celebrity style. No, that's not what Phil and Carrie do themselves, as well as the people they are training are are designed to do. We're accessible. We're like you, like everyone else. Just like every soul, just like everyone else. We, We are humans with our own background, our own experience. No judging. It's not about that at all. It's what's what is it in this moment that needs to be delivered as a message, either from your soul or from the spirit world? I don't want to forget to ask you about psychic readings. Not everyone is interested in talking to their loved ones. Some may, but there's a lot of value in having a psychic reading. Could you just talk about that? Yeah, that's actually, that's a good point. Because I'm when I first went in, I wasn't sure the, the lines seemed to be blurry. But it's very directive. It, it's psychic reading is your soul. What does your soul have to say? So my soul is communicating with your soul in a psychic reading. And it can, usually there's a need. And it can be in a variety of areas. You don't even need to say that that leave that to the medium to figure out to go and sense 
And it's more about you, the sitter, what's going on. A mediumship reading, strictly mediumship reading, would be someone from the spirit world, a loved one. Uh, you don't necessarily get to bring out your list and say, I want to talk to this person, this person. This. That's up to the spirit world. Who's coming through? Because the message that day is most likely relatable to whomever steps forward, whether it be grandmother, mother, father, spouse. It, it's someone who can relate to the message that will be delivered. And it's about the spirit person, just more of a confirmation that they're there and that uh, the evidence, you, you'll receive a lot of evidence in both readings leading up to the message. And and in some readings, it does, the one-on-one -on -one readings go a little bit back and forth. Sometimes you'll feel things psychically, and then there may be someone who steps in from the spirit world. In that case, the medium should be alerting the sitter, this is what's going on. And the sitter would always say, no, I don't want that. Or yeah, please, absolutely, whatever is going on, please let me know. It's up to the sitter as to whether they accept a shift in the way the reading goes. That sometimes happens as well. We say to there's no advising, diagnosing, or prescribing, none of that goes on, or predicting. That's not what that's about. It's about what's the current thing going on? What's the current need? Or what is it in the psychic reading? Or in this mediumship reading, what is it currently that a loved one from the spirit world wants to relay to you? All important words. My values truly once I experienced the hardcore hit of grief, to help people through grief, help alleviate some of that pain, help understand the process. The more we love, the more we hurt, but there's an automatic thing that happens within our biology and help people through to the other side, but also to believe in the afterlife. And the reason I want that so much, Tim, is so people can live a good life now and know that they have the support of their loved ones, to know that there's a bigger picture. I always end the episode saying life is an education for the soul, but we're here to explore, to make mistakes, to experience the ups and downs, all of it. And we grow, we learn. And as painful as things are, even some things going on maybe in somebody's life right now, while I don't think that everything happens in our life for a reason, I think mistakes happen. There's people that do some awful things. I think that everything we experience, we can learn from. And on top of that, we're able to help our fellow traveler be of service. You might not read it, write a book, you may not be a medium, but you might be next to somebody on a train or an airplane or wherever. And the words you have to say are exactly what they need to hear. So we all have that level of service that comes out of that. So I think having a medium reading is great. But I also think there's definitely space for the psychic reading as well, because people need people. Sometimes just that confirmation that I'm on the I'm on the right path and this feels right to me. So people that are interested, don't shun a psychic reading. It's not, will I meet tall, dark, and handsome in my next two minutes? You know, <laughs> it's not that, no predictions. All right. So website, psychicmediumtim.com. Also, you can contact him there. I highly recommend you come do a course with Carrie and Phil. The basic basic training is at wedontdie.com. We have medium level one, followed by medium level two. Medium level one, you're working with your psychic faculty. As Carrie and Phil say, if you imagine a whole apple pie, that's your psychic faculty. That's how our souls communicate, give and receive information. Mediumship is just one slice of that pie because instead of working on the person who's alive in front of you, you turn your psychic attention to someone who is in the spirit world. So it's important to learn them all. I know in the month of March of 2024, Carrie and Phil will be in Australia and New Zealand. So if anybody wants to join them live or at one of their other live or advanced events, you can go to mymediumship.com. But the basic training, I call it that, is at wedontdie.com. You can click on the at home courses page. We have some guest mediums for a while, Carrie and Phil are away with the structure of psychic readings, structure of medium readings. That's Kath and Mitch Shirley. Also, we have our friend Nick Whittem, the history of mediumship, which is pretty incredible. It's not just doing readings like we spoke about today. The history is just vast and wonderful. Carrie and Phil just completed a three-day class in clairvoyance. 
And that is still on the website as you may wish to get the video replay of it and keep that in your library. Like I said, everything has a money back guarantee. There's a personal library for you that's created when you book a course at We Don't Die. There's a login button there. And most all of our classes are six sessions, two hours each. We encourage you to join live for those precious breakout rooms, but we understand that you may not be able to. So you can definitely watch the replay. There's a Facebook group included, or if you're not on Facebook, you let me know. And we have some practice students, some great students that want to practice in between class sessions. So that's all at wedontdie.com. And a shout out to Carrie and Phil and our friend Robert Lyon. There is a film up and coming, maybe end of 2024, beginning 2025, evidence of the afterlife, following Carrie and Phil on their journey, but underlying is the message of mediumship, why it's important, why this integrity and ethics are so important, why proper training is important. So just keep an eye on the we don't die.com website and we'll let you know as soon as more things come out about that. Tim, anything else you want to share or we're going to let these fine people enjoy the rest of their day? No, I think you've covered a lot <laughs> a lot of it there. Yeah, just be open for the synchronicities. You were touching upon that and, you know, things will occur and happen. And when you're ready for them, yeah, definitely seize the opportunities. Fantastic words, Tim. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I'm still so excited about that. And thank you very much for this. Oh, it's my pleasure. You never know where the path leads. You were just a guy, a young man on your path and look where you are. And I was just a gal, never thought I'd tell anybody about my interest in the afterlife. And here I am over 25 years later saying it is real. Speaking of it being real, we have now well over 400 episodes here on We Don't Die Radio aired on your favorite podcast site or on YouTube, the video portion. I also have Shades of the Afterlife. I was asked by iHeartRadio and Coast to Coast AM with George Nori to do as another podcast all about the afterlife. Here, while there's full-length interviews with one great person, on that podcast, I'm an investigator for the afterlife. So certainly there are clips with great guests, but also it's the latest research through science, through medicine, through, oh gosh, near-death experience, deathbed visions, terminal lucidity, all kinds of different reasons to believe in the afterlife. I do book reviews and so much more. So if you really want more, of course, you can listen to 400 episodes here, but I also encourage you to find your favorite podcast app, whether it's iHeart Music or Apple Music or whatever you use, and just type in Shades of the Afterlife. There's now over 170, 170 episodes. So they're pretty darn good, if I say so myself. So again, we don't die.com, my home base. Come visit us on a free Sunday gathering. They happen at 2 p.m. New York time every Sunday. They are recorded, so you can find the Sunday Gathering page and watch a replay if you can't join us live. So everything at we don't die.com. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. And yes, I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. And like Tim said, our loved ones are real living people. Know that, know that they're trying to get through to us, pay attention to those feelings. And whether you're working with the spirit world or someone here on earth, or even yourself looking in the mirror, give yourself that love, that generosity, listen, your feelings do matter. So I really wanna thank you for listening or for watching, and we'll see you again soon.